It's been always a, a great honor every time I come to MIT, you know, to uh, learn about what's going on and uh, having a very active discussion. So the, today is just amazing, you know, seeing some of the best signs uh, taking place right here. Just made my day. Um, so this is also a place MIT has a very strong uh, battery research. And coming here to talk about batteries is uh, actually uh, going to be fun, I, I bet. Um, so I picked the title of uh, Batteries Now and Future, and really uh, reflecting some of the real uh, I developed over the past 10 years at Stanford. So I see what's been happening, what's possible, and what are the difficulties, and uh, what are the promises. Um, a few introduction slides uh, just for uh, having fun. So um, this is uh, what's happening uh, you know, over the years. Right? This is what you see. Um, the mobile phone evolution going from this uh, really big one. Well, in old time, I remember I was in elementary school. Right? When you see somebody carry a phone like that, you know this guy needs to be really rich uh, in order to do it. Right? You start to wonder you know, why this is so big. Uh, at that time, I saw that as a kid, it's for people to see you have a, a phone you can carry around. But indeed, there's a reason behind it. It's the battery, the power you need is uh, gigantic, right? So uh, the battery wasn't that good. So over the years, you know, this go down smaller and smaller. <clears throat> and then something happened past 10 years. Reverse the order, right? So <laughs> now the phone gets bigger and bigger. I, I, I'm wondering whether one day it will come back to a size like that. So, <laughs> so you go deeper and you look at it, you say, well, what's going on? So inside, these are all those, uh, you know, uh, for display, electronics, control, and, and, and so on. But the biggest part is this big guy right there. That's your batteries. It's power hunger. Certainly, bigger phone give you better display where right? you can see it. Clearly, you can tap it, you know, easier. But major motivation right there is try to get enough power so to get the batteries. So you feel you know, most of the space. And uh, many things are happening. This is a, a time period. It's very exciting. So you see portable electronics is going very strong, uh, you know, nearly a 15, 20 billion dollars market. Zhong is coming. Uh, if you play with Zhong, I just have one. Uh, over the Christmas, so 15 minutes flight time, let's say, change the battery. So you need higher energy per unit weight. And then you see this one, <coughs> Tesla. You see all these electric cars. I also just happen to got one. I mean, the driving feeling is amazing. Although it's so, so expensive, right? So, uh, um, and uh, stationary storage, you start to see PV, wind. Well, wind is very low cost electricity. Uh, it's uh, very intermittent. And PV electricity now gets, gets to somewhere around six cents per kilowatt hour, as competitive as coal-fired power plant. Integration into the grid requires stationary storage. So adding this together, you look at this. Going from this tiny device right there, even though it's a tiny, it's only about 10 watt hour of batteries. But it's a billion piece of it, you know, of cell phones sold every year. So if you, add, you multiply this, it's about 10, uh, uh, it's a 10 gigawatt hour right there. 
So zone market is coming up, not clear how far this can go. So uh, certainly not like everybody will have a zone flying. That will be too much. Tesla's car is 85 roughly kilowatt hour. Big, gigantic batteries in there. So this will grow bigger. If you look at California right now, so we have a low pass, right? We need to go to 50% renewable. Right? If you look at that, our solar actually provide a lot. So we have a capacity to accommodate 60 gigawatt hour. That's gigantic. And the whole world eventually, if all the solar and wind coming in, so you're talking about somewhere around 10 terawatt hour capacity you need to satisfy. So this, uh, this very strong demand from very tiny device to something really big. So then how fast the battery technology can really go to meet this demand? This comes back down to the, these key parameters you are looking for. To get the drive, driving range going, you want the energy density to be higher, whether it's a watt hour per kilogram or watt hour per liter per, per weight and per volume. And then the cost needs to get down lower Safety needs to get a lot better. Cycle life needs to get longer as well. So ideally, you want fast charging rate. Even though this is the one, I, I don't think we need as fast as uh, you would expect to say five minutes. You don't really need it. Tesla has had supercharged already. 30 minutes get to 80%. Uh, you know, get you 200 miles right away. So it's actually very impressive already. So I did it. I personally experienced this. Go to supercharge and plug it in. You know, half an hour, you are ready to go. So now let's look at uh, some of these needs. Just looking at the lithium ion battery. So I'll come back to the reason why lithium ion. Uh, where we are right now and where we want to go in the future. And the cell level and the system level. Cell level means that tiny cell you see, whether it's a cylinder or it's a prismatic cell. System level is the whole thing, whole pack install everything included, right? So this is where we are, energy per unit weight. We are somewhere in the cell level 200 also, depending on the cell. If it's 18650 cylinder cell, it will go a little bit higher. It's a power cell, it's somewhere around here. We want it to be cheaper, long term. Near term, 10 years, if you can double, I mean, that's absolutely amazing. Double, it's, it's, it's good enough. Long term, three times. System level um, of uh, one hour per kilogram, you know, roughly divided by half, that's your system level, right? We want it to be also triple and system level. Then the same battery uh, pack size, you know, Tesla will go from uh, 250 miles, become 750 miles. That's just long, long enough distance driving range. And the cost is the major, uh, major thing right now. Cost is too high. So cell level, we are talking about 150 to 200 or so watt hour, uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. System, somewhere between 300 to 500. You know, lithium ion has been through this uh, really uh, uh, you know, deep uh, learning curve. If you look at five years ago, you are talking about 800,000. Now we are below 500. And uh, uh, some of you know, Tesla's power wall sold for uh, $350 per kilowatt hour. And the price, still making money, right? So, uh, cycle life, 3,000, you know, for the car, uh, could be good enough. But for the grid, if you get to 10,000, that's, that's great. So you look at this, this, this one. If you get system level cost to 150 divided by this 10,000, you know per cycle, per kilowatt hour, your electricity cost now get down to low enough. Adding into the solar electricity, then becomes very competitive. At the end, safety needs to be very good. So this is where we want to, to be in the cost, 150 system level. In order to make the cost lower, you know, you put on all this material, you put in all this battery management system, getting the pack going. The most powerful knob you want to tune to reduce the cost per kilowatt hour is the energy density. For the same size, you increase the energy, then the cost per energy will be lower. Just by simply maintaining the same manufacturing cost, everything is the same in cost uh, per kilogram. If you triple the, the amount of energy you, you store, then you already meet the cost profile. So that's what you need to do. So we, uh, in my group, we have been looking into high energy system for the past 10 years. This uh, can cause uh, this wage increase, can reduce the cost. 
uh, and uh, the potential can come. So now let's come to the science part. How do you store electron? At the end of the day, it's all about how do you store that tiny particle called electrons. Very lightweight, but very painful to store. They all have negative charge. You put them together, they repair. So it's hard to store a lot, right? So the idea now is let's balance the charge using chemistry. So I use the opposite charge, ions. That's your M plus coming in and combine produce M. So this is a process I often make joke uh, in, in university and, and Stanford, I say this is called overhead, right? So overhead rate, this is too high. Electron is so lightweight, but this big ion is so heavy, so many thousand times heavier than, you know, than this uh, electron. So uh, it's not 60% overhead, it's what, uh, you know, really, really high, 99 point something percent overhead. So in order to store this, you also want to have a host, that's your materials. You put electrons in, you put ions in, and let them meet right there. At the end of the day, you, you, when you do research, it's not about studying electrons anymore. It's not about studying the, that uh, uh, you know, uh, metal ion. It's actually the host. You spend all your time studying that. Try to minimize the overhead, make it more efficient. So well, let's look at the choice right there. Right. So for, for, the, for ions to balance the charge, you go to periodic table, you see it right away. Well, proton is attractive. You know, this is atomic weight one, right? So I'll, I'll let acid battery using acid, proton, to balance this charge back and forth. However, this has a limit. You know, active proton you, and the water is 1.23 watt. You split water, you generate hydrogen. It's a, it's a, you need to deal with that problem. And then lithium is heavier, but it's the, probably the, uh, the, the lightest one you can find. Um, you know, get to atom the uh, atomic weight seven. However, you know, because it's so electropositive, you can have a high voltage battery as possible. So that's a good deal. And then you go to sodium. You know, sodium is not bad. When you go to magnesium, it's attractive, right? It's now divalent. So one, uh, one ion can do, uh, you know, twice of the job. 25 divided by half will give you 12, close to lithium. Aluminum is good, right? 27 divided by three, that's nine really close to lithium. So this motivation to look into other uh, you know, ions. And then you consider the voltage. I just mentioned voltage. You want high voltage. And then you can power. You have high energy density. You have high voltage. For portable electronics, there's no, it's no brainer. It's lithium world, you know, because one cell gives you about four watt. If you go to other ions, for example, sodium, you, know, you, will, you will drop by a 0.3 watt. You go to magnesium, it will get lower and lower and lower. So, and, and then the cost will come in. We want the low cost, right? So lithium right here, you know, the cost is, uh, is, uh, is not low. It's high per kilogram uh, wise. Well, hydrogen nearly free, you know, and this consideration as a batteries. And the lead, zinc, aluminum, these are all good, $2 per kilogram. You, know, you really want to make them to work. Of course, it's not easy, right? This is multivalent going in right there. How do you get multivalent moving in a solid state structure? Just challenging. And sodium is very low cost. But this is a caveat. You know, many people work on sodium, including myself, will just say, well, lithium is high cost. We don't have enough lithium. But let's look deeper whether that's really true, right? So uh, if you actually look at the cost of lithium. And the lithium ion batteries, lithium cost is only about 3% of the cost. It's actually not that high. You replace uh, lithium by sodium, you don't really gain that much in terms of uh, uh, the cost. However, when you go to grid scale, the story might, change, might be changing. We'll, we'll come back to that later. <laughs> so with this choice right here, so lithium is uh, attractive. High voltage, lightweight, you know, single valent, move fast. So that's why lithium ion battery is dominating. So this is what you have. Let's say, for example, you have a cylinder cell. You cut it open, and you look at it, what's inside. You have these particles right there coating onto a metallic foil to store lithium back and forth. So you have a graphite as the uh, negative electro, lower potential, and lithium cobalt oxide as the positive electro back and forth. You know, lithium during, char uh, during charging, lithium electrons stay in the anode. During discharge, going to the cathode, just back and forth, many cycles. So multiple things need to take place in order to have a rechargeable battery working for a long cycle life. You need to move electrons. So if your solid is not conducting, so you need to solve that problem. You need to do conducting coating. You need to add in carbon black. That's where these batteries have. You need ions to move in the liquid and also in the solid. So that gave, give you the uh, power, right? So uh, you make sure you, they move fast enough in and out of solid. You need to take care of structure and volume change. 
you know, the rule of thumb in the past 20 years saying, you don't want big structure change, so that's why you choose graphite, lithium cobalt oxide. If you have big structure change, it just didn't work, right? So your battery will break. And the next thing is you need to have stable interface. Each of these particles facing organic electrolyte right there, there will be a self-decomposition compound called solid electrolyte interface, SEI, needs to be stable, transparent to the lithium ion coming in and out, but block the electrons, stop the further side chemical reactions. So past 20 years, you use graphite. Now the question becomes, in order to store a lot more energy, you need to consider new chemistry. Silicon can do a great job, 10 times more lithium they can store, right? Lithium metal alone also, amazing. Phosphorus uh, is, a, is a great material as well. Look at the cathode side, going from traditional lithium metal oxide, uh, going to the sulfur, for example, you have 10x capacity uh, increase as well. Voltage will be lower, about two watts or so, so, but the energy gain you have is actually gigantic. You can find the chemistry using silicon anode or lithium metal, combine these different cathode, color coded right here. This is a graphite, thinking about only the theoretical active materials alone. Don't consider other dead components. You have chemistry to reach 3x, three times of energy, and even six times. Now the question is, can you make it to work? So um, with this saying, we need to be also aware of, this is for increased energy density, cut down the cost, particularly for portable electronics, for transportation. Once you go to grid scale, you know, other ideas also come in. Let me assign a few examples. So, uh, one certainly is uh, locally right here, liquid, liquid metal batteries, highly scalable. Uh, Dong's group is doing it. Uh, my group, uh, this uh, Yes group is doing this, uh, you know, semi-solid, uh, right? Basically, in, put down the particle redox into the, you know, uh, the solvent, flow liquid in and out. This quinone base, uh, you know, uh, and, and the other side of the town, you know, uh, uh, with uh, these uh, redox molecule, my group work on uh, also a, a semi-flow batteries as well. But let's come, come back to the high energy, uh, uh, you know, uh, materials. Now the difference is really uh, uh, like this. The old materials is uh, this graphite, for example, lithium intercalation going in. There's no chemical bond breaking. You know, uh, these are host materials. Just have a tiny ship and then well, angstrom level, less than angstrom level to, uh, to uh, accommodate this uh, lithium coming in. New material has chemical bond breaking all the time. Host atoms really do not move right there, right? Sit still, and these host atoms move to nanometers, even 100 nanometer distance. Small structure change, big structure change for the new materials. 10 times or larger volume expansion for the new materials. So you see the challenges right there from atomic bonding scale, how it's breaking, how things happen, it's different. Individual of those uh, particle, solid, and the structure change, the strain, and the interface, you know, this is all now uh, become a new challenges to try to overcome. The whole electrolyte level expansion, you know, that can crack your packaging, leak out electrolyte, it becomes dangerous. So it's multi land scale level, you always need to come up new ideas how to solve this problem. That's what we did for the past 10 years. So we look into these high capacity materials, try to come up the right material design to solve this problem uh, outlined in the previous slide. And also we start to also implement new ideas. How do you make batteries safer? You know, at the end of the day, you pack so much energy into a given size, volume or weight, and if it's released in a way, uncontrolled, you know, the battery become uh, very, very uh, dangerous. Uh, it's really a bomb right there. So I will give you uh, a couple examples in this uh, uh, talk about how we think about designing materials, what's the new idea we can bring in to address the challenges in these areas. Let me use silicon as the first example. Silicon, I just told you, is uh, 10x, 10 times more uh, lithium ion storage capacity compared to uh, graphite. The problem we are facing is this volume expansion four times, right? Once things expand, grow so much, right? This will strain, structure change, and then there will be a breaking phenomenon ha happen. How do you avoid breaking? How do you build stable solid electrolyte interface? That's S here on the surface. If this volume expansion happen, you take lithium out, they're going to shrink, right? There's no interface, it just keep moving. How do you build a stable interface? This requires new ideas to, uh, <coughs> to realize. So we learned about the challenge of uh, this uh, set of new materials is through this in situ 
transmission electron microscopy study. So we started to use uh, this uh, technique uh, very early on. Uh, this is a TEM holder. You can mount your sample right there. Right? This is your metallic contact. You put a silicon nanowire, for example. And then you insert it into ionic liquid with, uh, this is your electrolyte. Lithium cobalt oxide is your counter electrolyte, your cathode. You apply a voltage, right? Lithium uh, well, electrons coming in, lithium diffuse or neutralized silicon, they all go into silicon crystal structure. Great silicon, silicon bonding. And then uh, start to have so-called lithiation process happen. You can put in the particles, right? These will all diffuse onto the particle and then jump around the particle, lithiate the particle. Let's see what's happening. This is a silicon nanowires with a 200 nanometer in diameter, coating with, a, a coating with copper layers, right? This is 200 nanometer scale bar. Right? Once you charge up the batteries, 5x of the actual speed, you see the silicon expansion uh, is uh, dramatic. Now this copper coating looks dark color on the surface, right? They get broken. So this volume expansion is uh, so powerful. Basically, it destroys the surrounding environment uh, easily. And then this, uh, there's a question about how small particle you need to make in order to not to have them to break anymore. You, we know small things is robust, stress, uh, strain relaxation uh, can take place. Let's look at this video. Um, this is silicon particle, 800 nanometer in diameter to start with. You put lithium in, crystalline silicon core string. This is amorphous lithium silicon shell. And uh, this strain will start to build up even uh, more and more, right? Because you lithiate the surface. This guy inside try to expand and squeeze outside. Eventually, you know, this whole particle just couldn't take it anymore. Um, it will start to break. And this breaking happened in a way very uh, uh, uncontrolled. And then the particle will lose contact, you know, uh, the battery will die. You lose your active materials. Electrolyte can come in if it's liquid cell, right? It will start to grow SEI, consume more electrolyte, make it die even faster. So using this technique, we find out the nanoparticle needs to be roughly about 150 nanometer in diameter, less, less than that. They, they don't break anymore. And, and wire is about 300, roughly around that range, right? This gives you the guideline, you know, how small particle you want it to be in order to avoid breaking. So we use nanowire, learning a lot. So we move on to the, uh, actually our generation two. It's been eight years, 11th generation. Uh, we learn something in every generation. We go to core shell structure. The core, if it's a mechanically stable, electronically conducting, the shell is a more of a silicon, that's better. So, and then we go on to a uh, hollow. We go on to the uh, double wall hollow, and then we go to Yorkshire, we go on, just go, keep going. Um, so 11 generations, so I fast forward. But I only share with you a few, we, we, which really capture the uh, material design principle, you know, essentially needed to make silicon to work, to overcome those uh, large volume expansion, breaking instability of SEI. So we pretty much learn through this process. As long as your particles are small enough, they just don't break. So that's easy, right? Make particles smaller. You know, as you know, chemistry training person, you know, making things smaller just straightforward. However, how do you build stable SEI? Sorry, electrolyte interface. Let's imagine you have a nanoparticle small enough; they don't break anymore. You insert lithium going in, right? This become bigger, lithium silicon, you know, four times volume expansion. Will react with electrolyte, forming this uh, uh, decomposition, decomposition compound called SEI. And then you discharge your battery, you take lithium out. Well, this surface will shrink back, and then this SEI will be broken. And next time you charge your battery, it will form, and then over the cycle, you know, uh, you go thicker and thicker SEI. Lithium be, uh, make it a very, very helpful lithium ion to diffuse to, through this long distance, and also, you consume lithium during decomposition. You consume electrolyte, the batteries die. So uh, this one year, I, I, I thought hollow structure can solve the problem. Actually, this a silicon hollow structure also expand, contract, expand, contract. So it, it didn't work. And then one day, then we come up with an idea. We say, well, at the beginning, it looked like it's impossible to solve. But one day, this idea came along. If you have silicon hollow structure, on the surface, there's a coating layer you can put down. You know in the order of about 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer or so. Mechanically very strong. 
If you start to charge out your batteries, this mechanical strong layer will constrain silicon volume expansion actually go towards inside. Then the outer surface still decomposes your electrolyte, that's fine. But after it, it, it formed, the SCI is formed, because the outer surface never move. You know, when you delithiate, de de remove lithium, it's actually the inner surface, right? Just contract back. So you are really artificially building something, isolate your electrolyte from the volume expansion direction. Volume expansion happens inside, it can go as crazy as possible, but outside is always static. So that's the idea we come up. So we actually made this. You, using synthesis, we made a silicon nanotube. It's not carbon nanotube, it's silicon. Outer surface is silicon dioxide. So silicon dioxide is very strong, and the lithium coming in, silicon get lithiate and expand. And then this is before, this is after you look at outer diameter, almost the same. Inner diameter actually shrink. So after I saw this TM image, I say, well, this idea is working. So let's build the real batteries. So we compare silicon wires, single wall silicon tube, and double wall silicon tube. After 2,000 cycle, very long cycling, you look at the surface, it's still relatively clean, right? So-called SELA is actually not that much. You actually weigh the SEI surface very smooth. But you look at single wall tube and the nano wire. This is this thick film formation right there, even just 200 cycle, not 2,000, only 200. So decomposition of electrolyte is too much. So the batteries die. If uh, you actually weigh the SEI, you look at the surface, this one has become very rough. This one, because materials, atoms, sil silicons are moving so much, you couldn't even identify the nano wire structure right there. So the bottom one, the double wall hollow structure, is a stable one. So we build, we build the batteries using this double wall hollow, cycling in different C ray. Let me just uh, show you one set of data. This is five minute charging and discharging, so called 12 C. Uh, over 6,000 cycle, very deep charging, put a lot of capacities in. So, you know, this is stable, this materials. So after this piece of work uh, in 2012, what we feel like we are getting somewhere. We know how to overcome the uh, materials breaking problem by going to small structure. We know how to build a stable interface by creating this uh, structure. Inside is hollow, let the volume expansion go towards inside, but the outer surface really don't move. So, but that's not good enough, right? If you look at your battery, you say, well, what are the problems right there? If you give a talk in a, a battery community, you get your feedback right away. There's a tons of questions start to show up, right? Use nanostructure, surface area is too high, even though you have stable interface. But the first fuel cycle, particularly the first cycle, you still consume a lot of lithium, too high surface area, that's not good. The second problem you're facing is, these particles are so small, you need to pack them very nicely to have limited volume to pack as much as possible. So this is called volumetric energy density. Nanostructure are not so good, if you, hard to pack. The third thing is, in order to build up enough capacity for giving size or per unit area of metallic foil, you need to load you know, multi-layer of uh, silicon uh, nanoparticle tubes on there. And uh, this is called mass loading, needs to be high. But if you do that, your electron needs to jump so many times along this nanostructure, roughly about eight, 800 times. And then resistance is too high, it's very hard to charge up, so it's hard to do high mass loading. We need to solve this problem. This is our generation eight of design. So we take a silicon nanoparticles, that's right here, 80 nanometers, they don't break anymore. But they still expand a lot, right? Four, time, four times volume expansion. Leave the space just about right, you know, uh, you can engineer empty space, and connect them, assemble, assemble them together into this structure we call permanganate-like structure. This black color is all, they're all conducting carbon. And uh, electrons can be shipped in, and outside you coat it thicker, make it very hard for the electrolyte to go inside. So your surface area is actually outer surface. It doesn't go inside. You minimize the side chemical reaction. You pack all of them together to increase the volumetric energy density. And then because this is all conducting carbon, each of these particles is wired up electrically by this conducting carbon. You can build high mass loading, still very, very conducting. So, we use uh, you know, a microemulsion synthesis to produce this uh, silicon nanoparticle uh, assembly coated by conducting carbon, you know, different size. You can actually do size selection synthesis and separation. So this is empty space. You can identify silicon is right here. This is your carbon shell, right? So uh, after we did that, so uh, it's, it's looking really interesting. There's a term called chromatic efficiency. 
You charge up with 1,000 electrons, how many can you get out? If you get 990 coming out, right? That's 99%. Coulombic efficiency, that's not good enough. You lose 1%, that's too much. So uh, we, this, we now get to a 99.87. So it's looking really, really good. Uh, and this first cycle column efficiency can go down high to uh, close to a 90%. Um, and a high mass loading, capacity loading, 3.7 milliamp hour per centimeter square. That's what you have in your cell phone and your laptop. So we are getting there. We're very stable cycling. So that's all good. But it's, is, is it all already you know, all solved, all the problems? So it looks like we saw the problem of nanostructure high surface area, all those things. That's still not good enough. At the end, energy technology is all about the cost, right? You know, you all understand this. Without the cost going down to that level, you will never make it. So silicon nanostructure, still very high cost. You know, graphite, you're talking about $10 per kilogram of graphite. Well, silicon, if you go, you know, solar gray or silicon, you know, polycrystal, you can get down to about two to five right now. But when you go to silicon nanoparticle, as soon as you go by silicon nanoparticle, 80 nanometer, you're going to find out it's as expensive as, nearly as, you know, expensive as gold. So every time a student buy 10 gram of silicon nanoparticle, I say, well, wow, how come it's so expensive? It, that, that's just a reality. Processing costs made them smaller. So uh, this is motivation to use micron particle. If you do one to three micron, right, virtually cost nothing. You know, you're talking about a few dollars per kilogram right now, high purity. However, we all know micron particle will break. It doesn't work. Once it breaks, you lose electrical contact. You grow this SEI right there. You consume too much electrolyte. So uh, for many years, we keep thinking, what if we can make micron particle to work, this big guy, even though they're breaking, there's no way you can prevent a uh, breaking, right? And can you still make it to work even they break? So uh, one idea came along, we started to work on two years ago. We take this micron particle, we grow a layer of graphene cage. What does cage mean? Cage means capture, you know, something inside, right? You don't want them to escape. And then graphene has this uh, you know, beautiful property. It's mechanically very strong, very resilient. But even with that, if you do graphene conformally directly onto the surface of micron particle, this uh, micron particle expands four times. Graphene cannot take it either. Even though their plane can shift and uh, all those amazing property, you still need empty space. So let's put empty space in here. So they can expand. They don't strain graphene as much. And then the silicon particle will break, but that you know, cage, they capture inside, so contain inside. So by doing so, electrically they are connected. And also electrolyte most, mostly stay outside if you do the graphene cage right. So there's not much of a SEI, you know, side chemical reaction happening inside. You have a hope you can make micron silicon particle to work. So we, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, work on, you know, very hard, try to find a method to grow graphene. Yet still have empty space right there. At the end, we developed the synthesis, borrow the idea from, you know, graphene a community. Silicon, we take it and then do the electrolysis deposition of nickel. And then decompose and, uh, you know, ethylene glycol type of solution, you get some carbon coating onto uh, nickel. If you heat it up 450C, nickel has, this beautiful property, it actually allow carbon to dissolve inside, and then when you cool it down a little bit, and then this uh, carbon will precipitate out and form graphene, right? This is well known in the, in the, uh, in the graphene research. And you know, copper can do the job, even though copper only grow mono layer or a, a few layer of graphene. But nickel can grow, you can control it, but, uh, you know, thicken now. You can get to somewhere close to 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer, no problem. That's what it takes to contain silicon. So we see this. This empty space, you actually weigh nickel, this empty space right there, all around. So this is uh, nice. <laughs> but would it work, right? So uh, now let's, let me share with you uh, some of the uh, TM in situ <coughs> nano indentation study to tell you this graphene is very robust. Uh, so this is one of the video. This is the graphene cage, right? We, inside TEM, we have a nano indenter right there, and then push onto this uh, graphene cage. And you push it in, you, uh, you know, you, you take out this tip, and then you see this uh, actually bounce back. You know, graphene is uh, mechanically very robust. 
you really need that for contain a uh, 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 silicon enzyme. But if you look at a uh, uh, you know, if it's amorphous carbon, right? You, you, if you do battery research, energy storage research, you know, if it's graphitic carbon, it's not uh, uh, crystallizing now. It's, it's more like it is some uh, graphitic domain, but uh, most likely amorphous right there. So this does not work well. You see this indentation study. You start to push on it. And then uh, and later you, you take it out, uh, you know, you see, uh, you know, this gets smashed, right? So uh, this is mechanically not, not strong. So you really need the, the graphene cage right there. So now let me come back. So with this uh, graphene cage structure, we actually build the batteries. And uh, this is cycle, cycling at the beginning slow, and then you cycle this. This is actually, uh, we can do very high mass loading, just commercially irrelevant. And without graphene cages, micron particle will just you know, decay right away. This is well known. And look at the cross section of the electrode, coated or copper foil. Graphene coated silicon right here, after cycling 10 cycle, you see 15.5 becomes 17.2. The electro level expansion is very little. That's because you have empty space pre-reserved right there. So they don't push it out. But if you do regular bare silicon particle, 11.5 becomes uh, 29, nearly three times going up. This is crazy. This is going to destroy your battery. So this is not good. This is fantastic. So we actually show you can do you know a, a really good cycling, and then you can also uh, um, uh, we build a full cell. It's it's looking good. The first cycle chrome efficiency. This is one I I, I want to emphasize. We actually can get up to uh, first cycle chrome efficiency, 92 to 93 percent first cycle silicon. That's because you use this graphene cage, and also it's micron particle, low surface area. You don't consume that much electrolyte. So you are getting to the degree this is matching you know, uh, commercial uh, battery's performance. Um, so with that, so a lot of learning from silicon. Um, we actually want to solve an uh, even more challenging problem. Right? Let's recap uh, a little bit. This is graphite layer structure. You put lithium in, you put the electrons in. This is intercalation. Volume expansion is 10%. And then we go to silicon, right? It's about uh, by 300%, so expand to uh, roughly 400% uh, also, even though depending on degree of lithiation, roughly, you know, that's the number. But even this is a big volume expansion. You still have a silicon as a host to host lithium and uh, electron. They expand, but you do have a host. If you go to holy grail of uh, a, a lithium battery research, is what about you do lithium metal? You don't have a host anymore. It's electrons and lithium coming in, generate lithium metal. The volume expansion and the relative scale going from empty to have some volume is infinite, the, and the relative, right, the ratio. So the no host nature of lithium metal is very, very hard to overcome. We are talking about just electroplating. So what happened is you would like to have this flat film and, and reality so easy to form dendrite. A dendrite goes out, show your battery, so catch fire, explosion take place. So this becomes a notorious problem. That's because of this lithium metal dendrite formation. You know, a lithium metal is so reactive, it always builds this uh, you know, SEI, this local hotspot, this was shoot out, very hard to deal with. So for several years now, uh, particularly when uh, uh, Steve Chu come back to Stanford as a faculty, so we start to uh, talk about this problem, start to collaborate. So the pretty much this become uh, um, you know uh, one of the key materials uh, design principle right there. You know, do you want to build a stable interface, lithium facing electrolyte? This stable interface means chemically stable and mechanically stable. Well, in the past, a lot of people emphasize mechanical stability. And so if I have a strong material, I can suppress that deformation. No, that's only one thing. You know, actually, lithium is so soft. It's so easy to press it. You know, melting point is only 180 degrees, right? This is a metal. You smash on it, it will deform, right? You actually don't need that strong material to suppress lithium. The key thing is it's not about mechanical strength. Lithium chemically is so reactive. Anything coming in, lithium will chemically react you know, with nearly you know all the stuff, and then cause the structure change, create new uh, chemicals, new material, cause volume expansion, structure change, stress build out, and then cracking. Once crack form, lithium dendrite will grow out. Well, this is what I call as a Chinese. I, I call this is called yin and yang. Right? You think yang is like well very strong. I beat on you. Right? I try to beat on you. But yin is well you can beat on me, but I chemically very reactive. Right? I can react with you. 
and then uh, destroy all, the, all your weapons. So I think lithium metal is like yin. So you need to design something to deal with yin. So this is the uh, uh, structure we, we come up, right? We do this hollow, uh, you know, hemisphere of carbon. This is amorphous carbon. And amorphous carbon turned out to be, it doesn't react with lithium chemically, but allow lithium ion to diffuse through. So this is the yin I have right now, right? It's not, it's stable, you know, it's, it is stable chemically. And then I want it to be hemisphere instead of flat film right here. If you have a flat film, you want to deposit lithium underneath. As soon as you have nucleation, you cause a local curvature that will crack your uh, amorphous carbon, and then dendrite will shoot out. So that's why we need this, uh, we want to have this uh, hemisphere right there. This is a pond contact. As soon as you deposit lithium, the whole layer leap up, so without breaking. So SCS still form on the top surface, back and forth. That, that's the idea. So we made this material, we, we use polystyrene as a template, deposit carbon on the surface, evaporate, heat it up, evaporate polystyrene away. You now this uh, uh, hemisphere will land onto the surface. You know, this is how they look from top view, side view, you can actually peel it off, you know, flexible. And then you use this as a layer to guide lithium deposition. You can actually form this a beautiful column right there, right? This is the cap layer with a hemisphere because as you already formed, you cannot resolve uh, uh, that hemisphere anymore. If you don't do this uh, interfacial layer, uh, you know, your control experiment will just shoot out a sharp needle in an uncontrolled way. That will grow into dendrite, will shut your battery, cause, you know, explosion. So now we have a you know, strategy to build a stable interface right there. It's looking promising, but we are not quite there yet. You know, our data comparison is Coulomb efficiency is a very nice parameter to measure this. If you have this uh, 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 carbon, amorphous carbon uh, hemisphere, the Coulomb efficiency can go high because you have stable interface, prevent uh, a lot of side chemical reaction between organic, electrolyte, and lithium. If you don't have that, you know, this will drop very fast and the batteries die. So, with the research going, actually we want to ask a question. Do we really understand how lithium deposit onto a substrate? Now, if you look at the literature, there is very few understanding right there, very few study. I mean, that can become the key. Why lithium like to deposit here, not there? Why it go, that, uh, go to one place uh, first uh, than the other? So we, we feel that we need to understand this. So this is an uh, experiment. Uh, you know, when we did research, we found out I mean, something surprised. So this is a copper. You deposit lithium right there. You monitor its potential. You start to have you know, this SCF formation, and then that position happening. And, and you look at this overshoot, and then come back. This overshoot is a nucleation. Lithium doesn't like to nuclear on copper. This is heterogeneous nucleation, you know, different crystal structure, lattice constant. So copper does not like it. Lithium doesn't like copper. However, if you put a layer of gold onto copper, right, you know, or on a, more, you know, a glass carbon conducting, now you put lithium in, you see a plateau, it becomes lithium uh, gold alloy, and then another alloy uh, in a phase, and then you start to have lithium deposition happening. There's no overshooting right there. So gold is great, you know, lithium likes gold. And then we compare the phase diagram, what's happening. So copper right here and lithium, and this is the temperature, this is composition, right? This is, uh, so copper does not have solubility in lithium. Let me repeat it, it's not lithium and copper. It's no solubility for copper and lithium. But gold and this side will have some, you see this, this region, right? Some solubility in lithium. What does it mean? It means when you deposit lithium onto a substrate, and then lithium is like a solvent, and dissolve gold away, gold will go inside, but this will happen slowly. It will form a lithium gold alloy, another alloy, and then it become more and more look like lithium before lithium really coming out. So you actually don't have a nucleation barrier. However, for copper, it's just direct jump from copper structure to have lithium showing up. So you have nucleation barrier right there. Let's look at whether that, that this argument is true. This is potential versus capacity you put in. We compare gold, silver, you know, we kind of shift the curve, you know, by certain distance vertically, so you can see the curve. No nucleation barrier on silver, no nucleation barrier on zinc, no nucleation barrier on magnesium. Aluminum starts to have a little bit, and platinum has a little bit. If we look at this side, you know, a big barrier right here on copper, on nickel, some on carbon, 
and then a team, and silicon still have a little bit. And then we actually go into the phase diagram and compare. Looks like it's consistent with the idea. This substrate, if having some solubility and lithium, then you don't have the nucleation barrier. If there's no solubility, you do. So let's show up. Uh, this idea allow us to control where lithium will go. Right? You will take a substrate that can be copper, a pattern with this gold line, and then you deposit lithium, and you see lithium all go to this gold line right there. So very nicely. And now this becomes exciting. Eventually, you really like to control where lithium go and your battery electrolyte. How do you do it? And also isolate your lithium from electrolyte without react with electrolyte. Now this is a beautiful uh, structure we come up. We made this hollow carbon. Inside this, this gold seed, you know, we use this expensive one to start with because it's easy to do gold nanoparticle chemistry, you know, to do synthesis. Eventually you can do zinc, you can do magnesium, lower cost, but let's start from gold. And uh, you can have this gold seed, this is amorphous carbon, lithium ion can go in. Now once you want to deposit lithium out, lithium will need to decide. Uh, does, does it want to go on top of carbon or on gold? Right? I, I was telling you gold, there's no nucleation barrier. Most likely they can go onto gold. Gold is only inside, so you can get this lithium metal deposition inside. But outside has the electrolyte, so you isolate lithium from, uh, 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 from the electrolyte. So we actually made this structure using silicon dioxide template, you know, and then put a gold particle right there, coat it with a layer of carbon, dissolve it with silicon dioxide with the gold seeds right there. These are the TM right there. You see this black dot? They are gold particles right there. You can control the number of particles you want to put in and, and, and all this characterization. So let's look at the one battery data, right? This is the one with all this hollow carbon with gold seeds inside. You know, after depositing a certain capacity, first of all, you don't see nucleation barrier. You deposit lithium straight. And then look at the image. After that position, you don't see those dendrites shooting out because lithium go inside of this uh, carbon shell. But the other one, without gold inside, now you start to deposit lithium metal outside. You see all this wireless structure. That's lithium dendrite coming. So eventually what we need to do is the space inside, empty space, define how much lithium you can deposit. You don't want to overly deposit lithium, right? If you deposit lithium, fill all the inside space, eventually they're going to come outside. So that's something in some engineering we will need to do for the real batteries. So I'm going to skip through this. This is an experiment trying to convince you it's getting better. Um, I, I do want to come back to this uh, question. So um, why doing all this research? Is it worthwhile? Eventually, we don't have enough lithium. Then we are all doomed, right? So uh, that's not good. So let's look at the uh, lithium reserve. Uh, lithium reserve is 40 million ton right now, easily mined lithium. This number actually going up this year. The reason is, if you look at the past history, at the beginning you think it's only 10 million, right? and then it becomes 20, it becomes 40. That's because when you look for lithium, you do find it, you know, easily mined lithium. But let's just assume we only have 40 million ton to play with, easily mined. What, what, what can we do, right? We, what can we do? So anybody would like to take a guess, you know, how many uh, cars you can make, Nissan Leaf, using the lithium reserve we have. Oh, let's take a guess first. In the whole world, how many cars do we have running right now? One billion, right? So that's a number, one billion car. So this lithium can make 10 billion leaves on leaf. So it's a gigantic amount. So certainly you can see the lithium and battery needs to be recycled. Um, and, uh, and then in 2009, um, the uh, this is the 2009 production, so this is good for 23 million Nissan Leaf. I'm really happy with this number. Getting 23 million Nissan Leaf on the road will be fantastic, right? So uh, if you want to go fancier, so you do Tesla. So this is a Tesla number. So we can get 3 billion Tesla on the road. So pretty good, so pretty good. Um, and also remember, uh, we, in the ocean, we have uh, 230,000 million ton, right? But concentration is low, 180 ppb. Research is needed to take lithium out of the ocean with low cost. Uh, that's a project uh, I would like to start uh, soon. Uh, so this is an infinite amount. 
Uh, however, we do need to pay attention to the grid scale. Uh, grid scale, assume uh, this is a, a electricity consumption for terawatt hour. Let me assume I want to uh, you know, store six hours for the whole world, right? That will be 24 uh, terawatt hour of a battery you need in the whole world. And the 40 million ton all go into making battery, you can make 240 terawatt hour. So 10 times more than what grid can take. However, you cannot use all the lithium certainly for uh, for this purpose. We start saying for at that grid scale, it's still well highly necessary to have other chemistry, low cost coming in, you know, highly abundant to do the job. But this probably can get we get us to somewhere, uh, you know, to really see what's the impact having grid scale storage uh, uh, batteries to influence uh, the whole energy landscape. So now let me come to the last uh, last thing. Battery safety, you know, uh, lithium ion have a flammable organic electrolyte, you know, high energy, it's dangerous. You have seen a lot of incidents. But let's look at the root cause, what's happening. So batteries uh, go, explosion can, can be uh, because internal reason, you have a defect, you charge and discharge, charge and discharge, and then you uh, charge in uh, maybe cold weather, right, there's an uh, overcharge happening. There's a danger formation and shorter batteries. Once shorting happens, it heats up, right? Once it heats up, and then your cathode, you know, lithium cobalt and so on will release oxygen. You know, and they'll carry lithium and active electron, and you have a flammable electron, I mean, this will just go. So the study show it's about 110 to 20 degrees also. You know, above that, you know, this accelerates so fast, it's much harder to stop. So you want to stop your batteries, uh, you know, going bad, you know, above that temperature, stop that. And then you might have external shorting, right? Go into accident, bump into your car, bump into your battery, cause shorting. Once you have shorting, this electricity will pass this through uh, this shot, heats up the battery very fast, and go through the thermal runaway. And it's also at the end, it's about the heating. When you heat up, right? You know, you have sparks coming in. So let's try to prevent that. Don't heat up your battery to the high temperature, no matter what's the reason. It's external, or internal reason. So we come up with this idea recently. On this uh, battery, it's a uh, uh, current collector metallic foil. We call this a thin layer of polymer, polyethylene or polypropylene. We blend this uh, nickel nano spikes, right? They look like spikes. And they touch each other, you know, they, they have this uh, uh, electron percolation pathway become very conducting. So imagine if battery heat up. This uh, polymer is going to expand. When it's going to expand, they're going to pull this particle away. You know, lose contact, you know, having uh, several nanometer distance without tunneling. And then this can potentially become an insulator very fast. That was the idea. And then once it becomes an insulator, you know, even you have a battery shorting, the hardest shot is what? Is this uh, battery materials, right, will give its electron through this distance, 50 micron, to the current collector. A current collector is so conducting its metallic foil, it ship all the electricity to that shorting and then go to the other electron. If you make this layer as insulator, it decouples this active material from the current collector, and now there's no, all this uh, electron dumping into the uh, current collector. You prevent this uh, instant high current, so don't heat up your battery that fast. So if you slow it down, it can actually become safe. So we actually put this uh, nickel particle, you know, also go graphene, like our silicon's case, or so nickel surface can grow graphene, make it stable, blend into polymer. You know, you can even make this a uh, freestanding, you know, conducting polymer right there. Now this is the key data. This is resistivity. Let's just pick one example, polypropylene, 30% by weight of nickel nanospike. At room temperature, it's very conducting this green dot. And then at about 95 degrees, you heat it out. And the resistivity drop, A orders of magnitude, become an insulator, very, very insulating. So this is beautiful. You look at it, you have so many particles right here. Actually, transition is so sharp, right? You kind of like, rolling expansion happen and pull this particle apart. And then it stops everything. So, and, um, Using this demonstration, for example, this is our polymer film right there connected with this LED. If you just heat a gun, using a heat gun blow on it, you know, uh, it becomes insulator. This uh, goes off. So, uh, so we certainly show this can be a reversible fuse. Battery heats up, right, you know, uh, and it stops. And then it cools back down. It becomes normal. So you can kind of uh, can get this capacity out, regular temperature, higher temperature, coming back and forth. 
And then using different amount of uh, nickel nanospy, you can engineer what's the set point temperature you want it to become insulated, whether it's 70, 80, or 100. So it's all tunable. So this becomes uh, uh, really, really interesting. Certainly we don't know when we go to really big battery, whether this idea still work. We're still doing testing. In a small cell, it works well. You know, when you go to you know, a different scale, and the, the, the problem you're facing, the challenge you're facing will be different. So I want to come, come to this slide right here. So this is where we are, and the, the, the black color. And the red color is where we want to, want to be. We do have the battery's chemistry. Potentially, can get me there. But the challenge we're facing is in the materials chemistry level, you know, very hard to deal with. Silicon is one example. We have been working on for eight years. We are getting very, very close right now. So lithium metal will come along, you know, sulfur might come along, and uh, you know, oxygen, uh, air, electro, there's a number of people here working on, you know, the challenge is still there, this might come along. Uh, this requires certainly all new ideas. <laughs> Let me end my talk by uh, uh, thanking the whole uh, uh, research group, uh, a lot of talented uh, graduate students and postdocs uh, to uh, make this possible. I'd like to thank my collaborators. I learned all the mechanics, you know, uh, after joining faculty from Bill Nix. He's one of the best person in this field. X-ray, you know, doing in situ X-ray, looking at what's happening is Mike Tony, polymer expert, Jenan Bao, you know, anything related to polymer, I'll go to Jenan and ask. Bob Huggins was uh, certainly a, a, a pioneer in the battery field. And Steve Chu bring a lot of new insight we call the white students working together. And this funding support from DOE, uh, particular EIE, and also uh, the Battery Hub, they see so. um, And uh, other funding sources as well. At the end, I would like to thank you for your attention. We'll be happy to take any questions you have. It's the uh, cost of, uh, I mean, it's the number one thing. Right, so um, the battery pack and the uh, Tesla's car, somewhere around $350 uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. You were, well, with a gigafactory coming in, that's my guess, You're not confirmed with uh, Elon Musk or anybody, right? That's my, my, my best guess. Gigafactory coming in with this learning curve, we might get to somewhere close to 200. Uh, dollars per kilowatt hour. Then you are talking about if you drive a 70 kilowatt hour of car, right? So uh, it's 200 times, uh, you know, 70. That require uh, $14,000. Um, and then Tesla is saying they're going to uh, uh, come out with $35,000 car. Probably the driving range will not be as high. Uh, and the battery cost, I don't know, maybe $10,000. And then how much that will penetrate into the market, so I certainly don't know. Uh, the, uh, whether it's you can get to a few, several percent or not, it's, it's very hard to, to predict. Yeah. And uh, even though it's, um, it can get to the level of, uh, many people want to buy it, I, I bet Tesla probably, and many other car company will be having a hard time to produce enough battery to match with that demand. So that, that scale is indeed quite challenging to, uh, to, to, you know, to realize, yeah. I probably didn't answer your question because I don't know, yeah. I'll just giving you my thought. So on some of your work with uh, on So that's a good question. So uh, the study we show right here is uh, fix a constant current and measure the potential. So that we don't see the current changing. Uh, and then you're talking about if we do different type of deposition, we fix the potential, then uh, uh, you can probably see a current changing. That's something we need to do. Very good question, yeah. I bet that will happen. You will see a changing and then stabilize. Yeah, 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 good question. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe I can follow up on that just a little bit. The alloying is very uh, intriguing. If you go to very high charging rate, can you beat out the alloy formation kinetics and then resume? Wonderful, the wonderful, yes. Uh, this is actually a great idea. We test it out. You are exactly right. You say, well, you know, who cares about nucleation barrier, right? It's only a you know, 50 millivolt difference. I'm going to ramp up my current like crazy. Then what it means is you drive over potential really big. And then every substrate will look the same because, you know, the difference is only 50 millivolt. We, we actually saw that. If you use high current to do the nucleation or say high over potential, you have so many nuclei all suddenly jump out. You don't amplify any particular dendrite. That's an idea to beat you know, one particular dendrite. That's a great idea. I'm uh, working uh, very hard on it, you know, full speed, adding a lot of manpower and, and uh, try to see uh, what, uh, what we can achieve. Do you have a question in that area? It's a fantastic area to work in, you know, having a solid electrolyte. Um, the challenging is, can you make this ion conducting, uh, ion conductivity go as good as a liquid? And also the interface between solid and solid, you know, minimize the impedance, don't, uh, doesn't grow over the cycle. So that's something we are, we are working on right now. Uh, also, uh, for a person uh, with uh, a lot of nanoscience background, uh, I start to see uh, the problem in a very different way. So working on some of the new ideas and see whether that, that will work. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks. scale storage a little bit more. So given the energy density is not really um, a key constraint for that application, um, which do you think are more promising chemistries? I'm actually not going to be lithium, but what, what is your kind of um, So let me, if, I think your question has two parts right here. Um, uh, for uh, many years, I also think energy density uh, it's not important for grid scale because you can have a big footprint. It's all fine. It can be heavy. In principle, that's true. That's true in principle. But when you go into the cost analysis, and then energy density becomes important. Imagine if you do flow, you do all the investment of all the pumps, all the pipes, all the wells, all the membrane, everything coming in. You have the basic materials cost, all these costs all coming in. You need to have a onset of energy density needs to be higher than certain value, otherwise the cost will not make it. Well, this also coupled together with cycle life. The longer cycle life you have, you know, this can change the equation. So indeed, it actually can become quite important. If you're talking about I only have 20 watt hour per kilogram, uh, 30 watt hour per ki kilogram energy density, I start to ask the question, that might not make it, right? I'm, I'm not saying having the conclusion yet, I need to look at the detail. But once you say, I go to, I have 100 watt hour per kilogram, and then I think it becomes so much more uh, attractive, you know, three times more energy. So we start saying, uh, you know, what's the chemistry uh, really, uh, you know, uh, can make it to the grid scale? So uh, you have seen uh, multiple examples right there. Uh, this liquid metal right here, right, locally at MIT, there's, uh, you know, uh, Quinlon base uh, and at Harvard, and uh, this vanadium flow already around the world. Uh, and uh, each of these uh, technology all have their selling point, their strong the strength. And there's also weakness right there, uh, still need to work out. So it's not entirely clear to me uh, yet. So, uh, but this all rely on everybody's creativity. If you can solve that problem, solve that problem, and then one technology will jump out, turn out to be very attractive. So, yeah. Indeed, I didn't answer your question either. <laughs> you want me to ask, pick the winner, but I don't think I can pick the winner. <laughs> So for lithium dendrite, it's still a clamping layer. Um, I think in a sense, our uh, hemisphere of carbon try to do that job, right? You know, get the lithium metal glow right there. And then our hollow carbon with the gold seeds inside contain uh, uh, lithium. 
And then there's people also exploring idea. What about adding uh, additive, certain chemical into my electrolyte? What that would react with lithium and build a very strong layer. So uh, very legitimate idea. But certainly lithium metal is uh, expanding contraction all the time. That can destroy that layer. Certainly it's challenging. Um, just a few ideas coming up uh, for my group. Uh, within a month or two also, we have three papers coming out. Uh, on lithium metal, and it's try to build a stable host. You can deposit lithium inside, really try to maintain lithium metal right there. So including using uh, polymer fiber, carbon fiber, to build a host, and then also using graphene oxide, sandwich lithium metal between graphene oxide. Uh, you can see that in, in about a month or so, yeah. Yes, gold seed is very expensive. So that's for the purpose to, for us to show we could get lithium metal in. Eventually, gold cannot be used. We need to use zinc, right? Zinc, there's no nucleation barrier. We also show that. Magnesium also can work. So gold, silver, these are all too expensive. So uh, what are the implications of, of this, these technologies um, in terms of material and the use of materials and the political implications uh, of, of some of the new necessities that are going to be generated in the, through these new technologies? Yeah, it's a great question. It probably um, beyond my uh, pay grade to answer uh, geopolitical uh, uh, implication right there. Um, but I can share with you some speculation. So. Uh, um, uh, well, lithium, right, is distributed in a place uh, sometimes not so friendly to us here. So would that become a concern? Maybe, uh, may maybe not. Um, you know, uh, when you make airplane, well, Boeing is doing that for how many decades right now? And the airplane, those uh, lithium is used as an alloy in the plane because lithium is lightweight. Boeing alone actually consume a lot of lithium as well. So uh, for so many decades, that doesn't show up to be a problem yet. I would like to believe the same story will keep going. <laughs> Speculation. Um, and then there's uh, certainly other uh, related material, cobalt, right, going to the cathode, nickel, and, and, and so on. Uh, the, their price is not low. Uh, they are distributed, you know, probably is a lesser concern geopolitically. That's probably as much I, 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 I can uh, share with you, and as much as I know, yeah. Can you at least mention some of the key countries that are involved? Yes, uh, the lithium is, uh, you know, uh, 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 Bolivia, Chile, China, uh, Russia. Um, so, um, <laughs> right? I don't know what to say. <laughs> what? Let's thank you for a wonderful session. Thank you.